Hey there, my name's Rod Yates and you are listening to Humans of Music, a Jackster podcast. This is where I talk to music creators and industry professionals about their lives and careers, the ups and downs of their journey and the lessons they've learned along the way. And my guests today are Wesley Schultz and Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers. Addiction has touched the lives of both Jeremiah and Wes. Jeremiah's brother, with whom Wes was also close, was just 19 when he died of a heroin overdose. Wes, meanwhile, has also been affected by a family member's battles with addiction. It's these experiences that inform the Lumineers' latest album, Three. It's a concept album split into three chapters and focused on three generations of the fictional Sparks family who were torn apart by drug addiction and alcoholism. Not surprisingly, writing it touched on a lot of raw emotions for both Wes and Jeremiah as they explain in this interview. We also talk about the band's formative years, the intense levels of dedication it took to find success, and how music helped them with their grief and much more. I met with Wes and Jeremiah when they were in Sydney last year, the day after they played at Sydney's Enmore Theatre. And on stage, Wes told a story about playing that venue on their first ever tour of Australia and how it got off to a disastrous start. And I started our conversation by asking Wes to go into a little bit more detail about what actually happened. The piano got detuned a half step without us knowing it. It was a keyboard. Right. And so the song begins with just a keyboard. So no one knew something was wrong until all of us join in halfway through. <laughs> and then it's a half step. So it sounds like the devil's notes. It's just the worst, darkest. And that was our first song. So it was the, it was the most traumatic way to, we're so happy to be here in Australia. To, holy shit. Especially is, back then. I, I mean, know. that was probably seven years ago. It was our first album. Like going to Australia, even it's still a huge trip. But back then it was like, we'll go to Mars. We thought we so might go to away. Canada for yeah. our first record, you know, and yeah. to be in Australia. We, we were starstruck. And then. It was so funny. That night, Stealth, the piano player, showed me the two notes that were being played together, and it was even worse than I thought it could sound, you know? <laughs> yeah, ironically, if it was detuned even more further away from the right notes, it would have actually been like a, right. maybe a beautiful harmony or something, but... Okay. What's the most calamitous thing that's ever happened to you on stage? Did, does that rank there you was, the top? That was, there was one where... It's we, up there, I mean... Was Lollapalooza yeah. in Chicago the one where... A former sound guy didn't turn the speakers on. That was uh, Coachella. Oh, so that's even... It's not that calamitous, but it was funny. Yeah. Is he, you couldn't hear, the, the audience couldn't no, hear you? We could hear it. They couldn't, yeah. Right. Yeah, so we started, yeah. I think it was the same song we're talking about called <laughs> Submarines uh, off our first album. We were playing Coachella and it was like, you know, 60,000 people or whatever it was. And um, we started and it wasn't that much applause. It's like flat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I think eventually we heard like cheers of like, was it turn it on or something or turn it up? I didn't hear anything. I just heard an explosion because the guy kicked on the sound halfway through, and I, did, I was like, that's an odd choice for everyone to get excited about that line of the song. <laughs> I think <laughs> Donald, he just hit the mains. The you sound know? guy thought we were uh, sound checking, and we were like, this is it. You know, right. we, we started well on, full on. So I, rem- I just remember my least favorite moment ever on stage was just getting shocked, like a small amount of electric electric electricity just shocking my lips which feels like it's as though you ever have to like have like pull a nose hair or something and it <laughs> makes you tear up yep imagine if your lips like had imaginary hairs growing out of them and it's pulling them out that's what it feels like it's the worst and so it wasn't grounded the microphone so every time i would brush up against it it would shock the hell out of me for the whole set for the whole set and uh I literally, after the set, I literally just ran. I just, I got off stage and I just started running. I was, I was just freaked out and I started running down the street. <laughs> and then I sat down on a park bench at night and just <clears throat> tried to gather myself, but it was, it was, was so this on Halloween? Yeah. A long, long time ago? Yeah, it yeah was, I remember yeah. that. So the album three, it's a very ambitious concept told in three chapters about three generations of the fictional Sparks family. Am I right in thinking you had this idea 10 years ago? Not for the, I didn't have the idea for the Sparks family, but uh, we had this idea that we wanted to do an album in three acts or in three chapters. And um, it was just rooted in this idea that we would enjoy taking an album in that way. And then we just had these tracks that, particularly Jimmy Sparks and Gloria, that bookend the album in the first and third chapters that really, they seem like really obvious themes, you know, these two characters and, oh, can they be a part of a family? Who would be the third? And then this junior character kind of emerged almost like a photograph developing. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, that makes sense. That plot makes sense. Um, It wasn't, you know, I I have great admiration for bands that 
come up with a concept record and execute it as though it was all planned from the beginning. And that's not what we did. Mm -hmm. We we were retrofitting this to tell the story, um, but I just don't know how people even um, have that ability to be that prescriptive about what they're doing from the very beginning, you know, uh, like The Who or something where you're right. like, this is a concept and this song's going to... No, this was more like we wrote some songs and then it, it seemed to fit. Um, it's been fun to know that there's a story there, but now reinforce it and, and also be confident in the... Something like Gloria is really... I had my friend's kid who's very young. He's like probably four or five. He sang that song back to me playing like a ukulele or something. And these are dark lyrics, you know? He's right. like... And... <laughs> And I'm like, wow. But it, I was happy that the melody hit him that way. Yeah. Because that was the, the idea was that you almost trick the listener into humming along with something that's um, way more uh, subversive. I, I had this friend, he's a painter, and he's like, I like, I, I think my paintings are subversive. I think your music is the same thing. It, it's, it's sort of under the surface, it's doing something else to people if they choose to let that in. Well, there is. I mean, there's a real darkness, to, as you said, to a lot of your music, but particularly some of the songs on this record. And I understand that Gloria in particular and uh, Leader of the Landside is in, inspired by a family member of yours who battled with addictions or is battling with addictions. Battling, yeah. Yeah. Well, what have you witnessed of this person going through? I mean, the easiest way to describe it is that, you know, it's like you're standing in the ocean getting hit by waves and you thought you could command those waves to do your bidding and that's just not how it works um in the case of this watching someone go to rehab and thinking okay that's the solution we need to save up money and now we need to spend on rehab and then that fails multiple times and then you know you get them a house thinking like okay you get them a place to stay you, you visit them you do all of these things you try to love them out of it and then eventually they just they keep spiraling and so for us watching her um go to rehab, then go to jail, and now be homeless. Um, that's what we've seen, and it's almost like there's a line in Gloria, you know, will you just decide there's easier ways to die? And I've heard that said in this family multiple times by different people. We've talked about it, and you'd think that would be the worst thing you could say, but it's almost like it's not compassionate to watch this and mm. support it, but I don't know what to do. So I think... Watching someone go through addiction and being on that ride with them because you love love one another, I think that's what I've seen. And I've been, I have a psychology background, sort of. My dad was a, a psychologist, and I was studying to be that, thinking that's what I was going to do, and it was going to be Schultz and Son psychology. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, as a kid, I told my dad that, and I think that that empathy that you find in good therapists, um, that's what we try to do in these stories um, is try to tell that story accurately and fully. And so part of the story that maybe is being told, I hope in this is that yes, it's tragic that there's this person spiraling and addicted and um, the family is suffering through that. But there's also this, this really, there's this bond and love with, within a family, no matter what, that is also beautiful. And so there's this, you know, in the same way we're talking about this beauty of songs in the darkness, to me, that's that's the tragic and also beautiful thing about this addiction is that it's still, you can't stop this family from loving that person or one another and banding together. So it's this, it's a strange juxtaposition of, uh, of things like crashing together, mm. you know? And is it, I mean, I guess all the material about it so far, it's been referred very much to as a person. Is that just to protect this person's anonymity? Yeah, I think... <clears throat> um, one of our, one of the bands we really like touring with, Jay Roddy Walson in the business, he has a song that says, uh, storytellers only enjoy the part of life that they can use. And I think, I feel like I never want to exploit this for bad. I think it's something worth telling mm. and it's something I'm a part of as, as the storyteller. But I also think I don't need to blow that person's spot up by saying, this is your name and this is where you live. And mm -hmm. I think the story itself is the important part. And so trying to not make it worse for them if they were to hear this um, by feeling outed, you know, or feeling shamed worse. I think that's a big part of addiction is shame and mm -hmm. hiding. And I don't want to make it feel like that. But I also felt so driven mad by the situation that by not saying anything, I might 
bottle it up and have some issues. So in a way, it was it was serving me selfishly to sing about it over and over and to write about it and make these songs with Jared because otherwise um, it felt like I was, you know, walking around with this and this was a way of releasing some of that. I grew up, I grew up around like I was friends with uh, Jared's older brother Josh. Yes. My my young brother was friends with Jared, and so Jared has his own um, experiences with this that I think. This album was like a shared, like a group therapy session or something yeah. where what? we were, you know, we were just, it was bringing out a lot and we had just had kids, each of us. And so there's just all this going on in the midst of making this record that I think really brought out a lot. Well, that's what I was going to ask because Jeremiah, you've been very open about the fact that your brother Josh passed away at 19 from mm, yeah. an overdose. How did these themes resonate with you and, and what was that process like of, of being part of this and, and, and singing about these these themes? I think when we started writing, the first song that had to do with the theme was, I think, Gloria. And then I think we started working on Leader of the Landslide. And then I think me and Wes went on a long walk around Donna. And I think it was just like, it wasn't anything wrong per se, but it was a time of like, yo, we need to like kind of talk. And there's like, for me, I felt like this dormant feelings were coming up or sort of like... Again, it wasn't anything was like wrong or, hey, we're talking too much about this or something like that. I think it was just important to be like, hey, this is like really intense. But I think that's also indicative that because it felt intense, even to me, and I know it felt intense for Wes, that's that's a good sign that this music is going to hit people. I think the messaging is not so much like a message in a bottle where you just send it and it's a one-way direction. It's more like sonar. You know, you're sending it and it comes back and I feel like... Well, I, I would like apologize to you actually because I... <laughs> I felt like a painter that just kept painting the same thing. You know, like there are some, I've seen that with certain painters, they right. get obsessed with something and they'll just do it over and over and it's a part of the, they're working it out, I guess. And I, I remember saying, I'm sorry, but this is like, again, going to have to, like this is addressing this thing and um, I'm sorry if this is like seeming to be really negative. I'm just, I don't know what I'm supposed to sing about other than what's on my mind, you know? Like, no, and I think it's it's interesting too because I think, you know, we just had baby boys that are beautiful and healthy, thankfully, you know, and it's it's been amazing being fathers and they're they're only a few months apart. They're about like 15 and 18 months respectively. And, you know, our band, the success, we're here in Australia talking to you. It's, um, everything's pretty great. And, but how do you talk about, something that the great things in your life that's not necessarily that interesting and um you know it does hark back to what what is interesting and what is therapeutic and what um um yeah i guess so but it was it felt um it felt good to talk about it too and it felt good to be a part of the messaging like i'm not you know the one singing but it, it still feels important that we're talking about this because um, it's honest to us, and then while it's intense, I think not a lot of people talk about it or are aware of it. Mm. It's like a subconscious thing where they they are aware that people have these problems, but no one's really addressing it that yeah, much. A shocking number of people, even in our own circles of friends and family, after this, it was like an icebreaker or something. They yeah. felt permission to address something and talk about it, and le I think less shame. And you know, I think that's so common at least in the States, it, it reminds me a lot of the stigma of therapy. And now that's so destigmatized now. Mm -hmm. There was a time when if you, people found out you were going to therapy, you were crazy. Mm -hmm. And now it's totally an acceptable way to balance your life. And I feel like saying to people that you're living with this either yourself or you love someone, that shouldn't be so taboo. And yeah. it makes it even harder because you're in this isolated zone. Um, so for, for us, I think it's been encouraging to see that, uh, you know, sharing that at all has like, even within our, even between the two of us, I think, and watching you express this to other people, I think there are people who will hear this that are very comforted by the fact that you can be open about it. It allows them to like, at least get it out there. Cause it, it you have, it's life's hard enough. You don't have to yeah. put on a front yeah. all the time, you know? After the break, Jeremiah and Wes talk about their upbringing, the first time they played together, and Wes recalls the question his mother asked him that changed the way he thought about his career. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Wes and Jeremiah from the Lumineers. 
It's often been written that Wes and Jeremiah founded the Lumineers out of their shared grief following the death of Jeremiah's brother. And we pick up the conversation with me asking them how true that is. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it definitely is it's always by nature gonna be press releases and and, mm. and stories made so succinctly, it would be almost like magical thought, like magical thinking. It doesn't life doesn't work that way. But I do know that um I do know that in a way, music fulfilled something for me of, you know, when I deal with something that's difficult, music is there for me. Mm. And I think having Jer as an ally and we work on this music, for me, it's been a, it's been a healing, not only particular to that. That was a part of what we, when we first started writing together, it was something I was really interested in looking at because it was, I think it was just upsetting to me. And, um, we've kind of boomeranged around, you know, it's like mm-hmm. we got really far away from that and now it's coming back. But I think it also helped that, you know, I lost my dad a couple, uh, now 12 years ago and that music was there for me, mm-hmm. you know, to, to deal with that. And, um, I think it's more like we both lean on music in a way that, um, brings us together as opposed to one event, this thing happened. And then the next day we were writing songs together, you know, that would be really inaccurate. Yeah. Did you both come from musical families? Yeah. My mom was a a nursery school teacher. She played guitar to her kids every day. Mm -hmm. My grandmother played piano. My dad apparently taught some music in high school, but then also he was like in the church choir. Okay. So it's not like a crazy, but it's musical family. But, and then my brother, actually, my brother was really into music. He got, he was really um, into guitar, and he would learn like you know slash solos from GNR, or yeah, he had that GNR guitar. He'd learn like Welcome to the Jungle in a day, or Pink Floyd and stuff. So um, I grew up in a very musical household. Okay, you cool. guys listen to classical music too, which was kind of yeah different. <laughs> I didn't come from a musical family, and my mom has openly admitted she's tone deaf, and <laughs> my dad was super shy. So I don't know if he ever could sing, but um, I, just related to. When we were young, your brother Josh and I, like we, we obsessively drew. We were really into drawing, and I think that's total relative to playing guitar or anything else because it's like a solo endeavor for a while. You're sitting in a room alone, often, and I just remember me and him would, we went to this class together, and then we would hang out and just draw independent, but we'd be in the same room together, and it was like this. There's a personality type. Hmm. It's like long haul truckers or something, where you're just okay with being alone and repeating something over and over that I think draws certain people to be writers or to be creative in some way that if you're really social, it's not going to make you that happy to sit in a room and figure something like that out. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but my family, no, my, my family is not, uh, not the most musical. My brother is like, knows a lot about music, but I don't know how musical he is either. So I don't know where any of this comes from. I think it's more just like, um, it's just grinding, I okay. think. <laughs> so was there anyone in particular that sort of pushed you towards learning an instrument? I mean, I guess if you um, come from a musical family, Jeremiah, I guess that was around you at the time. I think I, I think also you just, you're born with propensities to be good at stuff. Like there's, there's nothing else I would have really done in my life, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I just was really naturally drawn to it. I think the genetic DNA inside my body. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't remember any particular moment. I just do remember the first time hearing Beethoven, um, like a, you know, we've got like a cassette or something and just being like, what, what is that? Just being so perplexed by it. And then seeing a live band in eighth grade um, for the first time, just being like, what, what is music? What I need to be close to that. And, you know, I didn't do that with golf. I didn't do that with hiking or painting or drawing. Like Tiger Woods is playing golf at three years old. I, you know, I was just drawn to, to music at a young age and I don't know. I think it just, some people are born to yeah. do it, as cliche as that might sound, but I think it's true. And I think the Fresh Prince of Bel Air played some sort of <laughs> yeah. Even I mean, that, I guess that was like a, a social Incredible credit credit yeah. man. <laughs> That's right. I do remember that though, watching that, and he, you know, Will Smith is sort of meta in that show because he's sort of playing a rapper from Philly, and he yeah. I don't know if he actually was from Philly, but he was obviously a rapper and DJ Jazzy Jeff and. Do you remember this clip? He's at the dinner table yeah. and he... You put it <laughs> on amazing. I think you tweeted it. I think it was a social media post, but I, I literally do remember that clip being like, this is so It's like crystal glasses, cool. different yeah. levels of water. And he's beatboxing yeah. over it and it just was like, wow, that's so 
just wow, that's so intense and so uh, it's really moving. Good. Yeah, it's really good. It's not an easy thing what he's yeah. doing, and it's so casually done. Mm. Did you have a moment like that? Um, I just remember. I remember. This is. I guess this is more like trying to paint the picture. I remember being so interested in sports and the repetitive nature of like practicing a shot in basketball, but not being very good in the moment in a game. Like, you know, just really wanting to be, but I spent all my time by myself practicing instead of playing with a bunch of other people and getting better in that way. And I remember middle school, you know, they announced the, the basketball team and you got to like run and do a layup and I missed it like twice, you know. And then I went and and I just didn't feel very good at it. And I was like, man, I just choked. And then I remember playing this thing called the Opus Coffee House. It was just a school, um, you know, mellow acoustic guitar talent show kind of thing. And it was the first time I ever did something and I didn't feel that pressure in a negative way. And I just felt like okay up there. And then I just was relaxed and I had a good time. It doesn't mean I wasn't nervous leading up to it, but once this it started, I was at home in some weird way. What did you play? I played a, I played a Dave Matthews cover called Tripping Billies that is really, I mean, for rhythm guitar, it's very complicated to be able to sing and play over that. So it was almost like I was distracted enough with what I was trying to do that maybe I just didn't get psyched out. But it gave me a lot of confidence because I knew if I could do that, I could play a lot of more simple stuff mm -hmm. without an issue. But I think just finding something that you feel maybe like, oh, I belong, I, I'm, I'm all right at this. It was the first time, you know, I had felt that. And in sports, I was always so frustrated at myself, you know, mm -hmm. like, what, why am I, my brain would just lock up, you know? And now we go out on stage and um, I still think one day that's just gonna, gonna happen or something, you know? And um, it doesn't, and I feel very lucky for that. But I think a lot of it just had to do with feeling um, comforted by that. Like, oh, I can, I can do this and I can do it all right. What do you remember of the first time you two played together? Live or just in general? Uh, both. I remember the first gig, cause like on note one, my guitar strap just immediately broke <laughs> and fell off. <laughs> And uh, I immediately, after that show, went and got strap locks where they hold your strap in place. But I That's the worst, isn't it? Like yeah. You're, you're on your knees then, you're, you're trying to recover. It and... was rough, man. It was rough. Um, but I, I, I do remember a friend of ours linked us up, a mutual friend, Justin, brought us together begrudgingly for both of us. We just I just wanted to play with a drummer. And at the time, Jer was, uh, he was drumming, but... You know, Justin was going to be the drummer, and so Jerry was going to be on piano, I think, at the time, and bass. And, I think so, yeah. And I didn't really know how to play piano, but I was like, yeah, we'll I figure it piano. out. Yeah. yeah, which is kind of amazing because the piano is so big on this album. But we ended up uh, we ended up practicing together, and then we'd have these kind of dedicated. Okay, we have a gig in two weeks. We should probably practice six times. Let's say we'd make up a number, and we'd hit those marks. But it was more and more that Jer and I would be there early and working on stuff and we'd find ourselves just kind of obsessing over it and it kind of just we just showed up a lot mm. and that was like i think what just the hours we started putting in we meet on christmas day we meet on every holiday we just we just took it like very seriously and that wasn't for everybody so you're working towards you're working towards something yeah even back then you were like this is what it we was want. structured you know it was like it was it was we treated it like a like a monk or like a job or something, you know, you, you, you're committed to it because that's the only way to reap the benefits. You can't expect, you can't have great ambition and not sacrifice a lot, you know? So you, that was the idea. I was working a lot of service industry jobs to make ends meet. And then my passion and the, the enjoyment was all in the work of the music. So, um, that, I think that like sort of separated us from, from people at that age, because a lot of them just, it was super casual. And for us, we were like, this is a full-time gig <laughs> you remember before that, it was. You remember that character? What is that book by Dan Brown? The first one that became Oh, huge? the Da Vinci Code? Yeah. Do you remember that monk? I think he's like the villain. Right. He's like, he whips himself. That, I remember that word and like looking it up. Asceticism, I think is the word. Okay. Yeah. And like he mm -hmm. whips himself and he's like, you know, he's a, literally like a servant of, of God. And like, I remember being like, that's me with music. Like, especially at 19, you're just so intense about, 
your ambitions and what you think about the world and maybe you're a little arrogant and, you know, but I remember thinking that's how I feel about music and being drawn to Wes creatively. It was that, it was that serving the song and it wasn't, I wasn't even so concerned about blowing up success, gigging. It was like, I want to be in a room and when you hit space bar on the computer and you listen back to something that no one's ever heard before, you're like, yeah, that's it. I remember reading this, uh, hearing an interview with Jack White that his creative relationship with Meg White deteriorated significantly when they'd be in the studio and he would be like, holy shit, this is like, listen to that sound. I bet like a guitar tone on whatever. And she just was sort of so ambivalent or, you know, not into it. And he learned to hone that instinctive producer, you know, thing about, wow, that's really good. And I yeah. just remember that happening um, – Songs, if we were to listen to them now, I'd probably, you know, be like, oh, we've written better songs. But <laughs> at in the moment, I think me and Wes probably wrote 75 plus songs pre album one. Right. And we recorded them, and some of them were even on iTunes a long time ago. And we got them mastered. And yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. basically a thousand dollars to scam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was a, uh, it was so interesting and cool. Just that sort of obsessive writing and what can we do with music and, mm. How can we, you know, procure sounds and talk about things and whatever? Um, yeah, my mom said very early on, like I was, I was one of those kids that obsessively got into something and then quickly bailed. You know, it was like for for a year or two years, I'd be like, I'm doing this, and then all of a sudden, I was on to the next. And um, so I said, Oh, I, I I found it. I'm gonna play music. I know it. And um, she's like, Okay, and then. She checked in with me, you know, a few months later, and she's like, so um, what, what do you want to do with this thing? And I said, I want to be a musician. And she said, uh, like a full-time musician? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, a full-time job is 40 hours. How many hours have you practiced this week? And that was the – I was so full of shit that I was – I just walked away, I think. And But it always stuck with me that it's such a simple, easy way to approach it. Just clock hours, and you'll naturally get better. Now you have to like showing up to that – that gig, mm -hmm. which we did, luckily. It's like what you said about Stanley Kubrick, like loving, one time you told me he loved being around a camera and a set and the smell of the film and the, you know, the chords and like the whole process. And for us, it's almost like the whole thing forms this enjoyable life. You know, it's like so much of it, it's like a, it's like a tide going in and out. So you know, it's always a new thing. Right now, we're we're talking to you. We were on stage last night. Um, before that, we were writing. It's it's always like an on to the next, and there's something so stimulating about that. But um, it remember, takes a lot yeah. of unglamorous, like years of of being into something that allows that to happen. That I think if you just know that as an artist, we always I was always thinking it was like a war of attrition. There's so many good, talented people, but they just have to be around for their moment mm. if you if you give up too soon and choose a career over that you're never going to like get that music back yeah. you, you, so many people trick themselves and think oh, i'll take this job but like i'm gonna gig on the weekends or something and then for us we always had bad enough job not to criticize the jobs but they were jobs that we were totally willing to walk away from and quit if we needed to to go on tour now so i know some people will be, they'll become like a graphic designer or something you can't quit that now you have your gravy train mm -hmm. so we were always conscious of don't get too good of a gig <laughs> you know that yeah. you can't don't get that whole foods gig that has really good benefits <laughs> i just heard this really interesting tidbit about cristiano ronaldo you know uh -huh. like one of the best if not the best soccer player in the world right now and one of his teammates were saying he's like i never i'm never gonna hang out with that guy ever again and it was a joke <laughs> but he was saying that they were practicing soccer for like two or three hours training and then recovery and then eating. And Ronaldo said, do you want to come back to my house? And he said, yeah, sure. So he comes back and I think they ate like some salad or something. And then uh -huh. he's like, all right, let's go in the backyard. And he goes in the backyard and there's like a small like soccer field like set up. <laughs> and Ronaldo just wants to keep playing. And he's like, yo, man, I'm like beat. I want to like, you know, play video games or just chill or something. And yeah. he just said that guy is just an animal. Like – that guy deserves every ounce of success that he's gotten. And yeah. I think that's the biggest piece that gets lost in success is you see the end result and you become, you know, you find ways to punt, poke holes in that or you become obsessed with the end result and not what gets you there. And even back to what Wes was saying about 
like I could spend this much time doing this, but I, I definitely wouldn't be able to devote myself this much to anything else. I remember we had a really small gig at the Lion's Den, New York City. Nobody came to see us probably. I remember being on my near on my knees on like a beer soaked stage wrapping up patch cables and just thinking, this is awesome. <laughs> this is my life. Like touching the knobs, wrapping patch cables, having a little Velcro thing, you know. Yeah. Like we're gonna sell merch now. I don't know, just everything about it was you know, it's, that's probably a lot of people's nightmares, maybe that that yeah. situation. After the break, Wes and Jeremiah talk about meeting President Obama and Tom Petty and the coping mechanisms they developed to deal with success. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Wes and Jeremiah from the Lumineers. In 2018, the Lumineers tweeted the following. We live in a strange society sometimes, one where all along the way to success you're viewed as crazy or delusional. And then once you make it, people glorify and celebrate those leaner years. And we pick up our conversation talking about whether people viewed Wes and Jeremiah as crazy while they were trying to make it. Yeah, I mean, I think I I felt that way uh, a lot because I was I stuck around our small town. Jer was finishing his his university and living at home, and so I came home temporarily, thinking that I was taken off soon to go live somewhere and start my life, and. Um, then we started making music and it was mag- it was great. It was magnetic. So I was like, okay. So I got a gig as a waiter and then another one as a butcher or at a butcher shop, like slicing deli meats and stuff. And, and in, and then at a Starbucks as well. So all those three gigs, I was interacting with all hometown people. And now I'm in my mid twenties. With a super expensive, sick college degree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, they're coming into like, let's say get their cold cuts or their meats for the week. And they would go. Hey Wes, you are you are you all right? Like, what's where are you? What's going on? Where are you headed? Like, and I was like, oh, I'm playing music, and they would look at you like, he doesn't get it. <laughs> and those are the same people that are like, I know that guy, and they come to the shows, and they're really supportive. It's just how would they know that I was ser- taking it seriously? They don't mm-hmm. see the time spent, so I I don't fault them now, but I do think it's an interesting climb where. It is really a deterrent. Society doesn't really like celebrate it in a way like the grind. They they will after, but they during it. I remember a lady saying to me, saying to my mom, you know, he should really write songs about math because there's money in that, and like kids who learn like th- there's no one doing that, and he should do that. And she told me, and I'm like, you know, 25, living at home, and I went up and just like wept. I just like cried like a little baby. Because I was thinking, no one gets that I love this and want to do it in a way that's not like, I'm going to go write math songs. I hated yeah. math anyway, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> like a Raffi? Yeah. Remember Ra- Raffi was in America? Or Ralphie or kid, whatever. Yeah, kid songs. I don't know. Yeah. That's just dark. Uh, it was so, it pointed out to me, it was a sacred thing and it was not being viewed that way. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I think that's just like, other musicians should know that mm. that like it's just because you're not getting a bunch of reinforcement of just how great you are doesn't mean you should stop uh it just means that it's not going to be that easy and don't be bitter if you do succeed or fail this means nothing like they're gonna either be really critical of you or blow smoke up your ass and say you're better than you are once you've made it so you ha- you have to find the truth in the middle of all that and define yourself to you so that you don't let someone else do that and then manipulate you, you know, like when you're signing contracts and doing all this stuff. I think we've been able to keep our autonomy. Like every every album we make, literally no one hears a note off it and they'll sign us to one record deals. That's all we do. So it's it's really simple for us because a record label's job, in our opinion, is to help us promote the album. It's not to come in and tell us if we have a single or not. Um which was the old way of doing it. Yeah. And it, it allows us to just feel unadulterated creativity and that autonomy of here's the artwork, here's the songs, and here's the sequencing. And then they can help us put it out in the world, which is what they've done. So, you know, I think that by, our, by having any sort of su- success that came on late, we were already okay with saying no to a lot of people that weren't willing to give us a deal that maybe... Um, led us to make the albums we want to make. And you got to credit, I mean, we were just super lucky to have the uh, the sweetheart slash bulldog lawyer that we met through a friend of a friend that became such an ally and got us those deals that kept our freedom, you know? So 
well, I think we get to do it for all the good and right reasons, but it was almost like not how you draw it up. It yeah. was so people were like in our town were like I mean, Jer's mom and dad let us practice nonstop any hour of the day. And so then the poor neighbors, I mean, we should play them like a private <laughs> yeah. back show. So when you struggled for that many years, because what was it, seven, eight years before Ho Hey became Prob- a hit? Probably. Yeah. So yeah. when you when you struggle for that many years, but you still have that determination, when that success finally comes. I mean, we were in bands before that too. So of course. like this was just that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. So you feel like you're never gonna but what, what was the I'm sorry. I'd... Well, I mean, just you know, you've you've developed these coping mechanisms to deal with the fact that you're still grinding it out for years. What about when success comes? Do you have to develop a coping mechanism for that as well? I, I think I became maybe too much over weary of it. Um I remember I'll never forget when we signed our management at the time. Um, for some reason, Wes, I think was in Denver with his girlfriend, now wife. And I was with two other members at my house in Ramsey, New Jersey. And I think we signed something. Oh, yeah. And then the guy in the band, this guy Max at the time was like, Yo, do you want to go get drunk at the bar? <laughs> and I remember just like, probably because I wasn't with Wes, the person that was like, you know, we're like running this thing together. I was just like, Yo, I'm gonna go take a walk, and there's like a there's like a bicycle path by like this like public library where I grew up, and I was just like pacing that, and I was just um, I don't even know what that's symptomatic of. I just think I was like so used to people maybe not giving you know a crap about us or never wanting to be one of those stories where like people steal this money from you or they take your music and your image, and, but for whatever reason, I just remember the first time that was like getting management felt like a very big deal because <laughs> it was indicative that yeah. things were about to s- start up and th- that literally is what about happened. Like our yeah. lives changed. Yeah, even at the meeting with management that we ended up signing with, I remember you were so serious in the corner <laughs> and I thought something was really wrong. And I think it was just, you were just like bugged out by like the prospect of the next step. And, but I looked over and I thought, I thought you were having some issue with the person at the table with us or, so, like I, I was just I don't you don't see that look on your friend's face that much and I was like, what's going on? <laughs> you know? But then yeah, dealing with success, it, it was just interesting. I think for me personally, like even when we upgraded to the bus or we got nominated for Grammys, I just think I was so weary of it, and I think it's just it's not something that I'm intrigued by or do well with. I think I just like trying to keep my head to the ground and making sure that I don't lose the creative edge with Wes. I never want to be unaware that we're starting to be a shitty band or never mm-hmm. want to, I never want to be unaware that things are slipping around me and I'm un, truly unaware of that. So I think. How do you do that? I don't know. I would just be anxious. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, I, I honestly feel very centered now. Now I'm 33. This was like, you know, seven or eight years ago. And um, I have a much, I think, healthier perspective on everything. But at the time, um, Success also hit us later in life. So mm. even though I'm sounding like I was a mess, it was still a lot better than it would have been if we were, you know, 15 or 19, mm. even, you know, even 21. That still would have been pretty young, obviously. So um, I remember, been, yeah. I remember having like lucky things. Like I, I, used, I had just clothes that were stage clothes that if I ever lost, I would freak out. Like right before I played SNL, I thought I lost this shirt that I was going to wear on the show. I woke up in the middle of the night and I just started like tearing the room apart. My girlfriend was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was, I Life just, with a musician. I just yeah. freaked out. And then, and then I found it and I was fine. And she right. was like, you are out of your mind. <laughs> and I had this hat that I, that I would lose occasionally. And that, that was my route to not feeling changed by the industry or something was sure. like, I'm wearing the clothes. I got these thrift shops that I've had for years that are me, you know, it's me. And I was so afraid of that. And then I remember being particularly just trying to be conscious of like everyone's wearing these flannel shirts. We're not wearing flannel, you know, <laughs> yeah. like just very, uh, like I didn't want to be pigeonholed before we even took off, you know, right. and, and they're going to do that anyway. You know, as a, as a writer, you have a comparison point of like reference. You have to say, this is the folk Americana move, movement and mm-hmm. these guys are in it. And I totally get that. But I think at some point you just have to be that band or you're not, you know, you have to define yourself. Like, it was very cool to realize that there was an era where there was grunge music with rivals. You know, there was Soundgarden and Nirvana and Pearl Jam and a few other bands that were these sort of looked at as rivals in a way. And then at some point, Soundgarden just became Soundgarden. Right. It wasn't like 
Soundgarden. What do you think about Pearl Jam? What do you think about Nirvana? Like, it was just, they were just existing and they they carved out their own like space. And I think that's what we hope we are, we're on our way to. And I feel like we're, we're, we're kind of, I don't know if we're like there, there, but I feel like that's our goal is to just have our own like space where, yeah, in the beginning there's these reference points, but then we kind of make our own niche. And I think for us, it was, it's always been kind of evident if you listen to the music, it's super uh, minimalistic, it's stripped back. It's kind of like the economy of sound, like how little can you, how much can you say with the least amount of materials, Mm. you know, Uh, just that to us was always the most interesting. And so I think at over time that will play itself out with people. Uh, you just can't have that overnight. You know, yeah. you, you have to, <laughs> you have to go, go along with what a lazy writer or somebody who's just new to everything would just sum you up as. Sure. And um, have the patience to understand that fans and critics and everybody else, like if you're being true to whatever you're doing, I think eventually it kind of works itself out, like the Soundgarden analogy. Sure. But in the beginning, they're just trying to sell magazines and like, uh-huh. <laughs> you're a part of that machine now for yeah. the better or worse. Yeah. For all those things you were saying about success and being quite weary of it and just staying grounded, are there moments like when you meet President Obama or Tom Petty that it kind of gets a little bit harder to keep yourself grounded? I felt like Tom Petty was lost when he uh, he came into our <laughs> dressing room and there was it was like a pipe and drape so these drapes are not walls and i think he thought it was a wall so he almost kind of fell over I was like, who is this guy <laughs> and uh and then he came in and 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 had been really complimentary of this version of walls that we had done and that was totally shocking to me because i um i was ex- he had given this speech earlier in the night and didn't reference us as one of the bands he liked that night so i was thinking he actually hated us and hated the thing because that's what you do when you're really worried your hero hasn't seen you and you don't feel unseen. And then he said these really nice things. And my wife was there. I said, my wife walked down the aisle to this song that we played of yours, the same one we just sang. And he was really moved by that. And he told me all alternative lyrics to the song that I thought was hilarious. <laughs> and then he exited like out of a movie. I said, it was such a beautiful <laughs> night and you should be uh, really proud of all this music you've given all of us. And uh, just what a beautiful night. And he just goes, it was. And he just walks away. <laughs> and it was the coolest exit I've ever seen of a human being. Um, so that and and meeting Obama just felt surreal. Like uh, like he's like a hologram. You know, you're like with him, but you just he's just he at that point he's everywhere, and even his voice doesn't. It seems supernatural. So it's so booming, and um, so I think that stuff doesn't really phase in a negative way, it's just more, can you believe that just happened? Like, I can't believe that just happened. It takes years to say that really happened. I right. think the digestive period too is a little bit bizarre because you're sort of like the last one to hear about something. Like a weird but good example is Obama's like Spotify summer playlist. You know, I think he put Stubborn Love on like the, the PM. There's like an AM and a PM, whatever. And we'd gotten so many texts about that from friends. I, so I didn't actually see that firsthand and was able to digest that. You get all these other people's, their reactions first, and they're like, that's so, you know, freaking crazy or whatever. And then by the time you're done reading all these texts and you see it for yourself, you're like, I don't know what to make of this. This is just, this is <laughs> this is kind of surreal. And I mean, it, I remember my, my godfather, my sort of like surrogate uncle. It was so funny because in New Jersey, we have ShopRite. It's the equivalent of whatever your local supermarket is. Yes. And- he equated us making it with hearing us in the shop, right? He texted me. This was just a few years ago. And I was like, dude, we already made it. Like, what's going on? Like, why are you, why now a shop, right? That's doing it for you. So I think everybody has their weird moments. And for me, it, it's almost like, a you know, trying to play a trick on your own mind. But I think everybody who I've noticed is successful in and has longevity tends to forget about what's happened and try to think about what they can do next to be better. Mm. And having, and the, and the people who often fail just think they got it. You know, it's like, I'm good. Mm. I'm good. I got this. And it's like, no, you earn every time you write, sit down to write the song. Every time you play a show, you earn that crowd, you win that crowd over. I think a lot of that hunger, it's not, I, it's not something I would like wish for for people. You know, I don't know if it's like a fun state of mind to always be in because it would be nice to feel like almost that retirement mode of like, <laughs> I'm good. Let's go sit on the beach. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I do feel I do feel like there's some some phantom or fire chasing me that it's gonna always, it's gonna reveal like I was full of crap the whole time. Right. I, I'm a fraud or something. You know, you just feel like you really want to constantly be getting better, otherwise you're getting worse or something. And so, sure. you know, this is like for this album. <clears throat> What's been really for three, it's what's been so cool is I think we we feel we joke that every band says this and every actor says this about the movie they're in, it's the best thing they've ever done. And it's it's just so cliche. <laughs> but I'm happy to be a part of that cliche. <laughs> yeah, and I same. I really feel like this is this is the best thing we've put put out that was in our head and we couldn't normally quite get it, translate it onto record or capture it forever you know and this was the closest we've come and I've, I'm just really proud of that and I think I always say this like out loud because I don't I don't want to not be aware of it but like you don't know how many good songs you have in you. you don't know how many good records you'll ever make so when you are lucky enough to make one celebrate it and and high five or toast or do whatever you do because you know there's going to be a time when you're going to make something that probably isn't going to hit people the right way or it's not <laughs> You know it in your heart of hearts isn't the best, yeah. And that and and that's that's an awful feeling. So <laughs> I think for us, uh, we feel lucky that you know it's like we've made now three records, and each one it feels like we're still getting a little bit better. Yeah. And and that's a good part of the arc to be on. Yeah. Versus like I think you guys should hang it up and uh, just play the old stuff. You know. <laughs> yeah. So Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Are there people who you would like to give credit to for helping you on? your journey to this point? I definitely have a, a, at least a couple. One of them is um, I had a guitar teacher in in college. I I was trying to learn how to solo, which if you listen to our music, there's no <laughs> guitar solos by me at all. Um, and so obviously that failed, but we didn't really end up picking guitars up that much. We just sat and talked about music. And he, his name was Charles Arthur, and he he kind of just taught me these fundamentals of like a philosophy of around music for him. And I, it happened to really resonate with me of being minimal. And it's very cool. He would show up to a gig and all he'd have is a tuner pedal with his electric guitar and he could use any amp. And I've been around people who have pedal boards and gear and that's fine. Like some people actually know how to use it, but a lot of people kind of use it to cover up maybe what they can't do. And he could do it all himself and and he used to say things like you know have when you're recording have the stuff going into the mic be how you want the sound coming out of the speakers and we used to just not think that way we would say let's correct this in post right. i know it sounds like uh, this we'll but fix it later <laughs> yeah and it's like a very basic idea but some of the most brilliant ideas are just the most basic in mm -hmm. that way and so he taught me a lot of the common sense of like songwriting and so every time we get like a a platinum record in the States, I'll like, well, it's only happened twice for us, obviously, but like I send him one with his name on it. Cause he's for me, a huge reason why, um, like I, I feel like I found a path and like a passion for the way, how to write music and be obsessed over that. Like he, he taught me so much about fundamentals of songwriting. So it was almost like having a coach or something. Okay. You know? There was a guy I grew up with, uh, we both kind of grew up with him. His name is Joseph Bransfort, and he's a musician. And um, in town, when I was like 16, 17, in our small town, he lived in our town, but he didn't go to the same high school. So he was sort of known as like, yo, there's this sick drummer who lives. Crosstown you know, rival. Yeah, and it was just like <laughs> he was sort of this like ghost of a, you know, became like a larger than life figure in this really small town. And I finally saw him play drums, and I was my mind was blown. And then he gave me some drum lessons, and it was really cool, but. He just would do certain things. I get asked a lot, were you ever, did you study music? And the answer is no, but the answer is also definitely yes. I always talked about music. I always asked questions and I would have so many countless conversations with this guy, Joe, about music theory or just more lighthearted stuff about music, whatever. And just to, like as a small example, um, the C major scale is very simple. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, going right up. And I remember in my house in Ramsey on this piano, he played it from kind of backwards, like the highest note was C and then D, E, F. So, you know, an opposite, but it was still the C major scale. And I just remember 
as one of many examples, wow, my mind was blown. He's making something so fundamentally boring, interesting, and it just sort of opened up my mind to the possibilities that, you know, forget everything you think you know about music. Like, it's literally infinite, and um, I think it was a great starting point for me, whether on drums or piano, just being like, wow, you're yeah. kind of blowing my mind. He's kind of... He's also a real capoholic, if you ask me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one, time, one time we made a joke about this guy who loved capos, and we called him a capoholic, and Joe, the same guy, like, choked. Um, we don't, still don't know what it was, but he started choking, and so I started giving him the Heimlich. Jared start. he called... 911. Called 911, emergency services in And America. then somehow his airway cleared and the police show up and it's a bunch of like three musicians claiming <laughs> that he was choking, but we don't know on what. And the guy's like, all right, I got to come in and like investigate this a little more. <laughs> what the hell is going on here? No, but Wes was like literally giving the hind look like in my kitchen, Joe is heaving, you know, gasping for air. It was so intense, right. but the <laughs> capeaholic joke almost <laughs> took him down. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wes and Jeremiah, thanks so much for talking to me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. And that's it for another episode of Humans of Music. A big thanks to Wes and Jeremiah for their time, and thank you for listening. This episode was recorded at Forbes Street Studios in Woolloomooloo and engineered and mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale. The incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode. Or even better, feel free to share it amongst your friends and rate and review it. And remember, for all your music credits and to get the story behind the music, head to jackster.com. And while you're there, sign up for a free 30-day trial of Jackster Pro, the essential tool for all music industry professionals. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening. <laughs>